So, time to do the sequel to War of the Worlds. <coughs> Raven, sequel to the War of the Worlds? I'm sure you're familiar with my work. I've already done War of the Worlds 2 the next wave. Everyone already knows how terrible it is. No. No, 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 no. You don't understand, Decker Shadow. Not that War of the Worlds sequel. I mean, this War of the Worlds sequel. I have seen what the Martians will do. They will murder our brothers, our wives, our children. And if you are lucky enough to survive, you will spend the rest of your miserable lives running like hunted animals. Always knowing that because of your cowardice, in this moment, everything you loved was dead. We must remain together. We must fight as one. I ask you. I beg you. Who will fight with me? Who will live and die? My brother. made by a competent studio. Right. Well, have it. <sighs> Who's the internet personality with the best hair now? War of the Worlds is considered largely one of the most influential and most popular science fiction stories of the last century and a quarter. Written by H.G. Wells in that final decade of the 19th century, he put pen to paper and invented a scenario which was deemed impossible in an age where mankind believed it had reached the pinnacle of scientific discovery. Wells, however, was not so arrogant. And as much as you might say it was a really good analogy of the Boer Wars, which to all intents and purposes it was, it was also a very good analogy of mankind's arrogance in its lordship over nature, a theme that would not become as popular as it did until 60 years later. Here's looking at you, Godzilla. Its history is long regarded in America as having been made famous by the now more infamous 1938 radio broadcast, in which another Wells would put us out of place by not putting pen to paper, but by putting voice to the airwaves 
by creating fake news events, causing much of the United States to panic at the time. Now I'm sure many of you are sitting there smugly at your computer desks watching this video wondering how the Americans could have been so dumb back then. But I do have to remind you that there have been at least seven radio adaptions of War of the World since then with exactly the same results. And in one case in Ecuador in 1949, Orson Welles can consider himself lucky even in his grave that he didn't meet the grisly fate of this radio station there being burned to the ground by the then aggravated population resulting in seven deaths. The most recent panic can be attributed to the BBC Radio 1 production of Independence Day UK, where it had almost had exactly the same effect with the City of London being levelled by a giant UFO over Buckingham Palace. I've got to hand it to you Patrick Moore. You are in on the joke all this time, and I can see you still laughing, even in your grave, as you pulled up one last fast one in the UK. I salute you, sir. No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that human affairs were being watched from the timeless worlds of space. Minds immeasurably superior to ours regarded this earth with envious eyes, and slowly, and surely, they drew their plans against us. And it's on the airwaves, it seems, the novel dominates the human psyche. None more so than those two seminal works, the aforementioned 1938 broadcast by Orson Welles and the more recent musical release of 1978 from the talented pen of Jeff Wayne, which has refused to lay low on the borders of the United Kingdom and continues a brave and valiant fight to be heard on the mainstream in the United States. And well deserved it is too. Shame on Paramount Studio for holding onto that leash for so long. It's only a matter of time before we see the stage production of that show on the American shores. And I for one am hounding you, my audience, to make sure that Jeff Wayne gets the hint and brings this masterpiece over here for all of us to appreciate it in its beautiful live sight and sound. of Jeff Wayne's musical version of The War of the Worlds, alive on stage, invades the UK in December 2012, starring Liam Neeson in 3D holography, with further guest stars to be announced. From mind-melting musical extravaganza, book now for best seats. Jeff Wayne's musical version of The War of the Worlds, alive on stage, the new generation. On Celluloid, however, it seems to be a bit of a mixed bag. In 1953, the first film was well received by audiences around the world, but gone were the classic tripods that made the alien so... well... alien! And in for at least a short time, at least, were the green swan-like invaders that still have their own place in the iconography of the story's long dominant history on literature. The nations of the world mobilized their armed might, rushing to defend the Earth against the unknown weapon of the super race from the Red Planet. Is there nothing that can stop the Martian death machines? Guns, tanks, bombs, they're like toys against them! We know now that we can't beat their machines. We've got to beat them. Steven Spielberg would bring about the story nearly 50 years later with more of a thud than an impact, despite its obvious 9-11 overtones. Sure, it was good to see tripods back again, but not even Tom Cruise could save the film from being a mediocre success that raised more questions than it answered. With two low-budget films in tow, the much maligned Pendragon Films adaption was praised for being the only film accurate to the source material, but decried for poor production values, broken promises and terrible acting that only manages to keep its head above water for being a brave effort. Producer Timothy Hines is perhaps the only producer in history, other than Roger Corman, to have saved something from the mitigated disaster by creating a mock documentary by reusing footage from the failed movie. 
One more time and is much better, much more highly praised Walt the World's true story. I give the original film low marks for production and high for effort, but much greater praise for a successful achievement in making a much greater comeback from his original disaster. It's kind of sad to consider that Asylum Films of all production companies made the best adaption on the book in a long time, keeping to the overbearing tone of utter defeat in the face of a superior enemy extremely well. Then, of course, they fucked it up with a sequel. War of the World's Second Wave, which is just too fucking bizarre and terrible for words. I think fellow Rise of the Critics reviewer Decker Shadow does a much better review than I would have done, and I would even wish to attempt to do. So I'll point you in his direction as I refuse to touch that film with a barge pole connected by two other barge poles. I hate you, Raven. So, with Jeff Wayne's movie version of his fantastic musical in Development Hell, I guess we're stuck with nothing more than a mediocre celluloid history for this wonderful book. And yes, I know I didn't touch on the TV series in this review because that's a review for another time. But wait, what's this? The year is 2006 and we have an announcement from Heavy Metal Productions that they're working on a sequel to the novel, War of the World's Goliath. Well, okay, it took its sweet time, nearly eight years in the making, but it finally did get here, and I for one have been looking damn forward to this one. Putting the heavy metal movies aside for now, which are an interesting mixed bag of controversy in themselves, and no, I'm not talking about just the nudity and the boobs, which you'll be pleased to know is non-existence in this movie. But nine years of waiting? This had better be worth it. There's only so much the Dark Horse comic sequels could offer me, with an even more confusing anticlimactic conclusion which to this day still makes no sense to me. I want my Goliath now, damn it! And here it was, in Walmart, this past Saturday, with next to no fanfare, damn it. Had I not been looking for a Blu-ray writer at the time, I'd have totally missed it. So thank you very much, Tripod Films, for nearly making me miss this one, as after watching it, I have to say for a sequel to a novel that I'm sorry to say a lot of Americans really don't know that much about thanks to the Grovis Mill story, it's not only pretty damn good, it's a pretty damn faithful to its source material and quite cleverly nods its heads to the shows, comics, the books, events and even songs that influenced the production beforehand. And yes, that is Forever Autumn you hear in the background. It already gets a thumbs up with this song for invoking not only a memorable tear in my eye but for actually having the decency to give us long life fans of the book and the musical a respected nod in our direction. I'm touched Tripod Films. I truly am. Thank you. And it ought to be good with animation director Young Huan Sang, executive producer Kevin Eastman and writer David M. Bramovitz behind the helm. These are no small players in the film who quite clearly not only know what they want out of this, but who had the vision to make it work. Successfully. And yes, it did come out in 3D too. Sadly, I don't have a 3D monitor or a TV or I'd be holding a copy of that right now. But it in no way takes away my enjoyment of the film. With the recent letdown of a fair few DC animated movie titles lately, here's looking at you Justice League War, it feels good to have something that is, yes, heavy on the gun ho action, but not disrespectful of its source material in any way. Here's looking at you again, Justice League War. The story of a second invasion from the planet Mars is in no way an underplayed event, but cleverly crafted in with a much deeper plan behind the Martians' invasion than a simple let's take over the planet plot. Of course! That clip alone almost takes the class of this review away from it, but I won't let that TARDIS release. I have to admit, using our adaption of Martian technology from the first invasion against us is a very clever twist, even if it is only mentioned once and overlooks with a climactic battle at the end. The plot even cleverly ties in the very real historical events that lead up to the First World War quite cleverly in its own web of intrigue, showing that even our politics can still be our greatest enemy, even when facing a threat of an overwhelming enemy. 
The Martians are not underplayed in this in any way. They are hard ass, difficult to beat and a real threat to be reckoned with. But then unlike the novel that precedes this story, neither is man, who is just as prepared and determined as they can be to fight this menace and make the Martians bleed for every scrap of ground. Not even Independence Day could pull off a feel good for winning the day movie as good as this, even if at the end it's only the battle of many yet to be fought or told. So how do the protagonists carry the film? Well like I said before they're all gung-ho warriors of mankind, a la starship troopers only with a little bit more humanity to them. The select few who elect to put aside their country loyalties for the safety of humanities thanks to an inspiring speech by the English Captain America archetype Eric Wells, supposedly a fictional son of H.G. Wells, but this is an alternative reality, so I'll let that go. It is our duty. We must leave. No. What did you say? I said no! We're not just French or German or Japanese. We are Ares. We are human. I have seen what the Martians will do. They will murder our brothers, our wives, our children. And if you are lucky enough to survive, you will spend the rest of your miserable lives running like hunted animals, always knowing that because of your cowardice in this moment, everything you loved was dead. We will be traitors to our homeland. It is they who are the traitors. Those pompous, arrogant fools who call you to their war. They say they fight for their honor when it is only for their greed and their vanity. We must remain together. We must fight as one. I ask you, I beg you, who will fight with me? Who will live and die? My brother. I will. Deutschland can kiss my ass. Then there is Jennifer Carter, an America ex heiress of a multi-million inheritance. Is it true your father owns a railroad? No. He owns two. Patrick O'Brien, whose brother is in the IRA and is trying to get O'Brien to supply them with Martian tech for their war against England. You shoot me, brother, and there'll be hell to pay with Ma. If it ain't the hero of Ares. Get out the whiskey, Liam. To me baby brother, who will help us hijack enough heat rays tonight to blast the bloody English out of Ireland. Once and for all. Slanger Abraham Douglas, a family man from Canada, and though a gentle giant at heart, a pretty fierce fighter at the helm of a cannon. Cap or even Eric is fine. Sorry, sir. A bunch of us are going to the Green Man to let off a little steam. Thanks, but I, I have a few things I need to check over. I spoke to Lieutenant Carter. She asked if you were coming. But she did. And last but not least, Raja Mustadakansha. A former Muslim priest who's pretty handy in a knife fight against the Martian. Are we fit for battle? Would I be coming down now if you weren't, sir? No, of course you wouldn't. Please, accept my apology. Why don't you hate the British? From what I hear. Your people were living in palaces when the Brits were in caves. Now you're a colony. They own your asses and treat you like you were savages. As Shakespeare said, there is no darkness, but ignorance. Shakespeare. <laughs> Where'd you learn that? Oxford. I did all wog. No offense. Get to Oxford. I used to be a prince. My family disowned me for joining Ares. I know how that feels. My brother wanted you to steal weapons for the Fenians to use against the British. You knew? I saw you leave the bar the other night and guess the rest. You didn't report me? No. I trusted you. 
Then I checked the inventory to see if any weapons were missing. All of these characters provide a good team of protagonists with their own divided loyalties that take second place of a greater threat that their peers don't even begin to understand. Of particular note is O'Brien, whose brother quite clearly says, Where are they? The Martians are back. I didn't ask you about the Martians, brother. I asked you about the heat rays. We're at war, Sean. Yeah, with the English. I have no weapons for you. You're some kind of piss, Paddy. Don't you get it, Bucko? We'd all rather be dead at the hands of the Martians and live under English tyranny. You've betrayed us. And that comment finally tips O'Brien's hand as he realises that his loyalties lie not with the close blood that divides, but the greater brotherhood of mankind that should stand together despite their differences. It makes them all admirable in many ways, and I for one really warm to Welter's sentiments about the British occupation of Ireland. Even today, I'll be honest, being a British man, and say that we need to get out of Northern Ireland and let the Irish government govern themselves as a unified nation. But, 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 that's my opinion. So before you make a comment, I'll just get out of this debate and say I personally won't be swayed. And Roosevelt is not one to back down from a bar fight despite his dignified status. I said I'd rather drink piss than drink to them. Simulations and games mean nothing. And don't think that farting match with Spain and Cuba was a war. If Germany was involved, we would have ended it in a week. Everyone knows that the Germans are the best soldiers in the world. And after we kick Europe's ass, oh, <laughs> we'll come for you in America, Teddy. I said we'll come for you. Well then, why don't we start now? <laughs> Yes, the acting can be a bit stifled in places, but thankfully that's relegated to the minor characters who really don't take a lot of centre stage, and that can be forgiven. And yes, it's action packed, but it moves at a respectable pace for us, so as not to overwhelm us with pointless scenes and padding, which gives this 90 minute film a bonus for well used time. Visually and narratively, it's perfect, from the steampunk environment to the character's development, even as little as it is. The characters are not there to give us their life stories, they're there to fight a war. That's the focus of the real soldier in times like these. The past is just the driving force to the now, and these characters don't forget that their past is also what makes their present so valuable and their future so worth protecting. This is man's fight, not their fight, and they don't forget it. So, with a hard-fought battle at the end, this has to be crying out for a continuation of some kind. But considering that this DVD was released under the radar, I have to wonder if that's actually going to be a reality, sadly. Come on, Tripod Pictures! Whilst you didn't set up a cliffhanger, you did create the perfect setup for a great retelling of other war stories in this reality. Especially if they eventually want to bring the war to Mars. You put a lot of work into this and it would be a shame for you to ignore the potential, unlike Justice we League War which is currently baiting us for a sequel none of us want to see. If Tripod Films doesn't take the reins with this one it would be quite upset to see DC Animation let us down with a new sequel to an already terrible animated movie. And Tripod Pictures just set a new standard here. I'm looking at you Kevin Eastman. Don't let the side down. If you decide to make a sequel, don't have us waiting another nine years for it. All eyes are on you, Kevin Eastman. Make it happen.
I hate you, Raven. I hate you, Raven.